everyone. Um, welcome to 1882 Foundation Symposium 8, Session 2. Uh, greetings from Washington, DC. My name is Wei Gan. I'm a PhD candidate in anthropology at Princeton University and research associate at 1882 Foundation. I'm co-chairing this year's symposium with Kong Yan Yang, PhD candidate and lecturer in architecture at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, and Linda Wen, a recent graduate from Georgetown University. I hope everyone is doing well tonight and thank you all so much for joining us for our second day of discussions on reimagining museums for community well being, connection, and learning. Uh, so, during our first event last evening, participants shared insights on the imperative for museums and preservation spaces to not only be agile in the face of dynamic social, environmental, and public health conditions, but also to shift their models and frameworks so that they become. Uh, spaces that create and center community. Museums and other organizations play critical roles in bridging difference and bringing people together, as well as in providing frontline trauma support and venues for creative transformation. So following that rich conversation, today's session, which is titled Innovative Practices in Museums and Beyond for Commemoration and Healing, will highlight best and promising practices in design, education, research, and outreach that organizations have implemented or are currently experimenting with to engage with community ecosystems and make impact more intentional and concrete. Before we get into the meat of today's session, I'd like to go over a couple of housekeeping items. Um, today's event is organized into two mini panels with each followed by a short Q&A and then a concluding roundtable discussion with all six speakers. We ask that audience members mute their microphones to minimize potential disruption. However, at any time during the session, please feel free to utilize the chat function, which is located at the bottom of your Zoom window um, to share any thoughts or questions. We encourage you to interact with panelists and other participants through the chat. Our session assistants, Meng Shu Yu and Claudia Vinci will collect questions to forward to our session moderator. So now it's my great pleasure to introduce today's moderator, Ed Tipporn. Ed is executive director of Angel Island Immigration Station Foundation. He joined the AIISF team in November 2019. He has over 25 years of experience in the nonprofit sector. He previously served on staff at the Asian and Pacific Islander American Health Forum for nearly 16 years, uh, and most recently as executive vice president. Ed received a BA in biology and psychology from Washington University. He was a Nelson Mandela scholarship recipient in the Masters of Social Work program at the George Warren Brown School of Social Work. He's also a certified professional leadership coach. In 2019, Ed was awarded a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Award for Health Equity. And currently, Ed is a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Culture of Health Fellow. Ed, uh, over to you. Thanks so much for that introduction, Wei, and thank you to you and Hong Yan for the wonderful job you've done co-chairing this year's symposium. I also want to express thank you to, to Ted and the 1882 Foundation for hosting this eighth symposium. It's an honor to be a part of it. Thank you also to everyone today for joining the session. For those of you who have not had a chance to join for yesterday's panel, the core of the conversation between Tang Jamjaras, Herb Tam, Nancy Yao Nasbach, Michael Trong, Rachel Schumard, Cybelle Jones, and Jack Chun focused on how do we shift the paradigm from thinking about heritage conference conservation, heritage conservation, which might focus, for example, on a building, a site, a festival, or a craft, to one that's focused on cultural sustainability, where communities, community members are front and center. Some of the central questions from yesterday were, how can we foster sustainable change and keep communities vibrant, resilient, and well? What role does culture play in community well-being? And how can museums as cultural hubs play an active role in this effort? One of the models that Tang shared was that of an ecosystem of community well-being and what that could look like in practice as well as in action. Well, today you'll have the chance and the opportunity to hear more examples and promising practices from across multiple sectors and organizations. Much of this work that you'll be hearing about has taken place as we've all had to adapt to this past year in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. In this first panel, we have speakers from the government, business, and academic sectors. 
each will share some of their own perspectives and best practices on how organizations can help and have helped communities to remember, honor, and heal while also looking to the future and building towards social justice. It's my pleasure to introduce you to these three panelists. I'll give a brief bio for each of them, and then I'll give each of them an opportunity to share some of the work that they've been doing. First, I'd like to welcome Barbara Wyatt, who is a historian and landscape architect and is the primary National Park Service's staff member responsible for providing guidance on landscape issues for the National Register for Historic Places and the National Historic Landmarks Program. We also are joined by Catherine Lowe, who is the founder and president of the Eaton Workshop. With Eaton, Catherine aims to create a new brand in the hospitality space, inspired the power of content creation, holistic wellness, the progressive and entrepreneurial spirit, and social and environmental good. And we also have Dr. W. Warner Wood, who's an associate professor of anthropology at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. He's also the coordinator for their museum studies graduate certificate program. So welcome to all of our panelists for this first panel. Barbara, I'll turn it off to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ed, and um, thank you. I'm going to wait for my slides to come up so I can speak to the first one, please. Greetings, Hello. Hello. Greetings I'm Hello. Greetings. I'm loading the slide. Yep. Pardon? I'm loading. I'm loading oh, okay. your slide. Okay. One second. Okay. Well, I, I can uh, I can say my hellos while you're doing that. There we are on the first one. Greetings, everybody. I'm honored to be part of this discussion representing historic preservation. In this brief presentation, I want to show you how historic preservation practice has evolved, confront its neglect of Asian American and Pacific Islander resources, and describe efforts to rectify lapses in a program that is now 50 years old, the National Register of Historic Places. Um, wait a minute. Uh, we need to go back to my second slide, and I'll say next when we're ready to move on, if you don't mind. Okay, this one. Okay. Historic preservation as a national movement was born in the fire and brimstone of the 1960s. With the Vietnam War as a backdrop, the decade gave birth to the modern civil rights movement. So increasing solidarity among marginalized AAPI groups and spawned the Stonewall riots that energized and activated LGBT communities. Was historic preservation a bedfellow to the decade's social activism? In a sense, yes. Although federal law addressed the preservation of important resources as early as 1906, next slide please, by the Antiquities Act, alarm about the loss of the nation's historic fabric spread throughout American cities in the post-World War II era. In the wake of passage of the 1956 Highway Act and Housing Act, big swatches of American cities were demolished with slum clearance justified as an essential for, as essential for redevelopment and old buildings and neighborhoods considered blighted. At the same time, inner city commercial and residential areas were abandoned for the lure of the suburbs. Next, efforts to modernize and enhance the density of American cities included the demolition of some of our most iconic architecture with the loss of Penn Central Station in New York City and raging citizens and elected officials alike. The losses accrued through efforts to modernize American cities set the stage for passage of the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966. Next, the act established the National Register of Historic Places to be administered by the National Park Service. The National Register would provide recognition for properties that were not significant enough to warrant designation as National Historic Landmarks, the more elite program dating to the 1930s. The act also provided funding for the establishment of state historic preservation offices and for their mandated tasks of identifying and registering properties eligible for the National Register. Next. The initial emphasis um, uh, in state historic preservation offices was surveying historic architecture with little known about the nation's buildings and so many recent losses architectural surveys were emphasized rather than surveys of properties with more subtle histories. I speak from experience. I began my career in historic preservation by conducting so-called architectural windshield surveys in the mid 1970s for the Utah and Texas State Historic Preservation Offices. Next. All along, 
Historic preservation in the National Register were intended to consider the historical significance of buildings, structures, districts, sites, and objects of local, state, and national historical significance. The National Historic Preservation Act does not emphasize architecture over history or elite architecture over vernacular, but this emphasis characterized the early years, the early years of the program. In the first few decades, challenges to this bias surfaced and were successfully overcome. First, vernacular architecture was recognized as a critical component of our legacy. Then, landscapes became better acknowledged. Next. Beginning in the 1980s, intensive surveys requiring the development of historic contexts as a basis for evaluation became common. Typically, they included an overview history of a community and a thematic approach, such as education, industry, et cetera. I haven't examined these innumerable intensive survey reports, and I have no data, but I suspect the reports overwhelmingly focused on the white history of a community, even if the population was more diverse. Next, that gap did not escape the notice of preservationists, planners, and members of groups poorly represented in earlier surveys. With the turn of the 21st century, preservation programs in local, state, and federal governments began looking more seriously at the lack of diversity among National Register listings. States, cities, and some federal agencies began developing historic contexts to identify AAPI properties and nominate them to the National Register as National Historic Landmarks. Next. Because nominations are submitted to the National Park Service and not generated by NPS, the problem of the lack of diversity needed encouragement and funding from the NPS. In 2014, the agency established the Underrepresented Communities Grants Program for the preparation of nominations representing groups with a poor showing among, among National Register listings. For five, five years earlier, it had established the um, Japanese American Confinement Grants Program in an attempt to acknowledge the government's egregious treatment of Japanese citizens during World War II. Next. So what are the best historic preservation practices to use for commemoration and healing? I suggest that each of these bullets reflects steps that are necessary to increase the commemoration of AAPI properties. Healing will be enhanced with greater understandings of what and who is represented by AAPI resources. Just as many Americans can differentiate Irish and Italian cuisine and culture with ongoing efforts of commemoration and education, someday AAPI cultures will be understood for the tremendous diversity represented by these four letters. But we all need to help. Next. The National Park Service is using multiple approaches to explain the distinctions among AAPI cultures and to stimulate interest through various stories. Please check out the Telling All Americans Story website and the National Register AAPI Month website, which we keep up all year. This page links to almost 50 AAPI National Register properties. While you're checking out NPS websites, don't forget Teaching with Historic Places, which has AAPI history lesson plans and the heritage travel itineraries. I believe that the National Park Service has improved, has improved its efforts to embrace AAPI history, but there's always more to do. Ongoing collaboration between cities, state preservation offices, the NPS and AAPI groups is essential. Next. The Summit Camp Archaeological District is an ex excellent model. National Historic Landmark designation can be, become a reality and we're seeking it for this property. It is taken and will continue to take every best practice for this property and other AAP prop, AAPI properties to achieve the recognition they warrant and the protection they need. And uh, now Ted Gong has, has uh, allowed me to, to state again, I think most of you know that the National Trust for Historic Preservation has designated the uh, two of the tunnels and the Summit Camp Archeological District as one of this year's 11 mo most endangered historic properties. So um, that it is sure to have uh, some positive repercussions and um, and I look forward to, uh, to the year as we unfold the stories that surround it. Thank you. 
Thanks so much, Barbara, for that wonderful reminder about his, how historic preservation does help to lay the pathway for communities to, to come together for healing and for connection. <laughs> and congratulations on the recognition of the summit tunnels. Angel Island was previously on that list. We were named to that list of, of uh, most endangered historic places back in 1999. And that was definitely one of the game changers for our organization to be able to bring increased attention and resources to restore the site. So we're going to shift perspectives from the government sector and the National Park Service to Catherine Lowe, who's with the, the Eaton Workshop and represents perhaps more of uh, what the business sector has been innovating in terms of helping to build community. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you, Ed. Thank you to the 1882 Foundation and to everybody here. I'm looking forward to sharing these ideas with you. If you could just hold, can everyone see my screen? Great, so today I'm gonna explore the questions for today's version of uh, Day of the Symposium through the case study of how Eaton, a hospitality space, has been facilitating social justice and healing. Um, two of the driving concepts that have uh, spurred the creation of Eaton is this belief in a idealistic world, uh, a world that's more fair than the one in which we now live, and then also a dedication to building community. So personally, my background is in social cultural anthropology. I worked as an activist for a number of years and I also went to film school. So this is quite um, uh, expected that I created a mission-driven corporation and unexpectedly a hotel. You wouldn't think that a hotel would be there for social justice, but I, I do believe that the universal struggles to make progress is a combination of efforts in all sectors from policy to NGO work to legal to academic. And in this case, we're gonna be looking at the case study of how a mission-driven business has and a hotel has brought those ideas to life. Um, the vision of Eden is that we believe in this more fair world for all community, all communities and people to thrive. And our underlying mission is to transform hospitality into a force fostering creativity, community and social and environmental impact. Um, we've also been very inspired by the idea of Ray Oldenburg's The Third Place, which is a place outside of home and work. Um, and he really believed that the third place is necessary for civic engagement and democracy. Um, traditionally, that, that could have been churches, barber shops, parks, libraries, bookstores. And so here um, we've taken that concept for Eaton and re-envisioned a hotel space with that in mind. Some additional uh, principles that drive us is also practicing inclusivity for all marginalized groups and groups that may not uh, be accepted in mainstream places or that have been forgotten from history, creating a sense of a refuge, sanctuary, and safe space, especially uh, during the years that Eaton opened, which was in 2018. Um, we opened in both DC and Hong Kong in a very, I think, challenging time for both cities and Eaton ended up being a refuge and a safe space for the communities there. Um, also believing that Eaton creates the conditions for the actualization of the self. And when you do that, then you can really empower the collective too. Some of our core focuses are marginalized identities. So I'll go over some examples later. Um, human rights, which encompasses civil rights, as well as freedom of speech, the power of art, and then lastly, healing. Um, I wanted to talk about some innovations in design and architecture that center the concept of community building. Um, I know that many of you are in the museum world and a lot, a lot of that is, has to do with designing spaces and exhibits. So I wanted to share some of the design process for Eaton. So before we opened our first Eaton's a few years ago, everything was just an abstract idea on paper. We worked with designers and architects and the question that we asked them is, what would a utopian design and architecture look like? If Eaton is dedicated to the neighborhood and the community, as well as designed to welcome the local public, um, the way that we interact with the street is crucial to how Eaton expresses our engagement with the community. Our public spaces were designed to be flexible and engaging, 
encouraging the activation of social cultural activities, traditional walls and barriers were encouraged to be rethought or broken down and reimagined. Um, here's just a snapshot of some of the architectural sketches. This was an early sketch by a design firm of um, Eaton, DC. It later became our radical library. So we populated these books with a partnership with the nonprofit Teaching for Change with um, books on things from Black Panther to Asian American history to food justice and many more topics. This is a computer rendering by another designer on Eaton Radio. So this is the entrance to Eaton DC facing the street. And we were really inspired by the East Village Radio, this iconic institution in New York that was truly a space for community building. Um, our radio overlooks the street and hopefully that also drives people in and activates the space. Um, this is just a chart that shows the concept of Eaton. So we have the physical spaces here that we've built. They have hotel rooms, food and beverage, artist studios, workspaces, music venues, event space, a community radio station, a cinema, library, wellness center, retail exhibition, and gallery space. I know that's a lot under one roof. And then uh, the way we've programmed those spaces is that we activate it by having um, cultural programming, artist residencies, and we also commission and produce a lot of original media works. And then when those two meet, hopefully in the middle, you get to build true community. Um, so we opened Eaton DC in downtown Washington DC a few years ago. We also opened Eaton Hong Kong in the Kowloon neighborhood and both have really taken on a life of its own. So I wanted to share some stories about how we've created those spaces to help us honor, heal, and also build social justice. So on the left here, you have the exterior of Eaton Hong Kong. Um, instead of having billboards to sell things, we decided to do a collaboration with Saiza Cruz Bakani. She's a migrant worker photographer from Hong Kong who photographed the plight of domestic workers. And she later became a Magnum Foundation photographer. Uh, we commissioned her to take original photographs of series of same sex couples to celebrate uh, this concept. What if you were free to love anyone you choose? And doing so made quite a statement because in Hong Kong, same sex marriage is actually still outlawed. Um, on the right, we have Eaton DC. The top right uh, is a photograph of Eaton DC. It's very tiny, sorry for the poor photograph, but we did a partnership with Four Freedoms, which is the artist run platform for civic engagement. And uh, this is the Arabic word for human. Uh, we have had that up for some time a few years ago. And this is also Eaton DC. We did a collaboration with the DC based video artist, Robin Bell. Um, he really thought that Eaton represented human progress and a brighter future. And during this time, we were still in the previous administration. So it quite it had quite a lot of symbolism for the city of DC. Um, we also hosted Michiko Kodama, who's a nuclear bomb survive, survivor and peace activist. Here, she's, she is doing an event at Eaton and we also commissioned an original film to tell her story. Um, this is chef Tim Ma. He used to work at the NSA as an engineer, but at age 30, he decided to go against his Chinese parents' wishes and to pursue his passion of food. And so we opened our restaurant called American Sun with Chef Tim. I just wanted to read an excerpt of this letter that he wrote that really moved me and brought me to tears. Um, he wrote, dear mom and dad, you witnessed the struggle we had as Chinese kids in Arkansas. The ridicule, the brick through the window, the sadness. Your strength has gotten us to this point. That decision to raise us within the constraint of our Chinese homes, but as Americans, I applaud your resolve. You taught us a language you did not know, fed us food you could not cook, and immersed us in a culture you did not understand. With that, we became American, though we looked worlds apart. I know you would have to introduce us to other Chinese people as my American son to explain why I couldn't speak Chinese or why I didn't know our culture, but I am proud of who you have allowed me to become. So that letter from Tim is featured in, in the restaurant, which is called American Son, what his parents used to call him. 
Um, and throughout the restaurant, we also curated a series of immigrant artwork uh, from many different cultures. And uh, it's a really beautiful tribute that's based on this very personal moving story from our chef. Catherine, I'm gonna ask oh. you to please wrap up your remarks, please. Yes, for sure. So this is, uh, lastly, just to wrap up, this is our uh, Eaton DC. I just wanted to read a few words also we felt it was really important to honor the local Piscataway tribe in DC. And so uh, Sebi, who was our director of impact, he talked about how the exhibit on his tribe in the National Museum of the American Indian was such a huge achievement because they're so often overlooked in this city's history. So these are photos from Eaton's uh, grand opening. We held a land recognition ceremony with Sebi's family, and this was a a uh, 360 degrees video art exhibit featuring Piscataway images. Um, so just to wrap up, I just have photos of more programming that we've done, really building the intersectional links between different underrepresented communities, Asian, Black, Indigenous, LGBTQ over the years. So just some photos to share that. Um, maybe just to close with, a very meaningful project we did was with MacArthur Genius and artist Mel Chin. This is the lobby of uh, Eaton DC and the lobby trend goes through different rotating exhibits. Right now we have Khalil Joseph's Black News exhibit, but we started with Mel Chin's Fundred exhibit and that actually resulted in him bringing families and children who were affected by lead poisoning to DC. They came, they took part in the exhibit, gave talks and they actually worked with legislators to pass uh, legislation that protects children from lead poisoning. And so Mel, Mel did this project with us. So this is how we engage and activate our public spaces for healing, social justice, social change, and really acting as a museum and community center within a hotel. Thank you so much, Catherine. It's so clear that your values and under your leadership, the Eaton Workshop is, is grounded in this approach of building community. And we know that not only can the corporate sector and business sector do that, but also the academic sector can also contribute to that. So I want to invite Dr. William Warner Wood to share some of his remarks on some of the work that he's been doing to help build community. Thanks very much, Ed. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen. Just do the desktop. Can I get a, just a confirmation from anyone verbally that you see my desktop here? Yes, we can definitely see your desktop if you want thank to make that full screen. You. Yeah, thank you very much, Ed. There we go. Okay, well, first of all, I want to thank the organizers um, of this uh, symposium, um, the 1882 Foundation, for the invitation to participate, um, and for the wonderful uh, presenters so far. Uh, this panel, I'm sure the next panel will have great presentations as well. Um, the focus of my presentation is on a participatory documentary traveling exhibit. Uh, part of a larger community eco museum project in southern Mexico, I was invited by community members to consult on a little over seven years ago. And where I'd like to begin is with a few key terms here. Um, this phrase making kin uh, from the title of this presentation itself healing community by making kin in Lamentania participatory action museography on the coast of Oaxaca. Um, making kin. Uh, comes from the work of feminist scholar Donna Haraway and her focus on multi-species ethnographic work. Um, featured most notably in her 19, or sorry, 2016 book, Staying with the Trouble. The phrase highlights creating mutually supportive relations with humans and those she calls the more than human, the other species we share our world with. Participatory action museography takes its cues from participatory action research, um, a framework developed in the beginning in the 1950s. It's an alternative to traditional research programs driven by research topics identified by theoretical concerns, the results of which are published and read by the peers of researchers for the benefit of contributing to the refinement of our knowledge. 
Uh, PAR, participatory action research, begins and ends with a community partner directing the focus of research based upon their interests and concerns, and the results are directed back to the community as a way of contributing to further understanding of the issue. I'm taking this PAR approach and applying it to the development of museum uh, programming and other kinds of museum work, uh, calling it participatory action museography. Um, and I, I should also say that um, using documentary photography as, kind, as a part of this kind of participatory action work was developed in the 1990s by a cultural anthropologist named Carolyn Wang, whose work uh, was focused on women and access to healthcare in China. Um, and it's a methodology known as photo voice. La Ventanilla is actually the name of the community where I've been working, and it translates as, as little window. Uh, in English, it refers to the rock outcrop on the beach near the community, just over the shoulder of these folks in, in this photo. So uh, let's begin with La Ventania and where it is. Uh, thanks to Google Earth, this is um, a representation of where La Ventania is in the world. It's right down here at the very modern tip of the Pacific coast of Oaxaca actually where um, the, the Pacific coast of Oaxaca runs east-west. Um, it's located uh, along uh, a little loop along the road of travel destinations um, focused on small-scale beach and ecotourism. The area had been a center for the hunting and slaughter of sea turtles until 1996 when by presidential decree in Mexico, uh, that kind of work was put to an end. And since then the local economy has shifted to, uh, to tourism and especially ecotourism. Uh, this again is a Google image of La Ventania itself outlining the areas um, uh, that are visited by tourists in La Ventania. In 1996, three La Ventania families got together to form a cooperative, and La Ventania has become an ecotourism destination where tourists visit a mangrove via a guided tour and learn about the various environmental management projects that are being undertaken there. A quote unquote island out here in the mangrove um, is a destination uh, designated animal sanctuary and Center for Community-Led Environmental Restoration Projects, including the museum project I'm consulting on, as well as, a, as two open-air palm frond roof uh, restaurants uh, where visitors can relax towards the end of their tour. Bef uh, just before the pandemic struck, roughly 50,000 visitors were coming on a yearly basis. All the photos in the rest of my presentation were taken by six members of the cooperative chosen by the cooperative for a project designed as a means for them to document their lives and work. The photos and Spanish captions they wrote for them, which I haven't included here, uh, are the representation of themselves to the wider world. A major part of their work is focused on sea turtles and they patrol the beach mostly for egg poachers. Each of the six photographers worked with an iPad they got to keep in exchange for their work on the project. In addition to taking tours, visitors uh, who wish to can participate in the conservation efforts themselves, such as these students from Spain who participated in a nighttime uh, patrol of the beach. Um, over the course of about eight months in 2017 to 18, um, our collaborators took nearly 4,000 photos and wrote captions for about 400 of them. Sea turtle release events are very popular, especially with kids. As part of the photo voice component of this project, we conducted workshops and brainstormed sessions with our six team members on what to take photos of, uh, among other topics. The workshops also focused on how to use the iPads to get permission from visitors to take photos, among other topics. For many visitors, the highlight of the tour is the boat ride through the lagoon in the mangrove on the way to the island where they learn about birds, uh, the mangrove itself and the mangrove trees, as well as other flora and fauna, as well uh, as <clears throat> the, um, the fact that the uh, mangrove has been hit by two hurricanes, one in 1996 and the other in 2012, and have, they have an ongoing reforestation uh, program as a result 
Um, and of course, visitors can learn about that work as a part of the tour, like planting uh, mangrove trees. Laventania, however, is most widely known for the crocodiles of the mangrove that the uh, cooperative manages. Their relationship to the crocodiles, many of which can be, uh, they can identify by sight and have named, are the focus of many photos. The crocodile hatchery on, a, on the island is one of the highlights of the tour, as is the opportunity for visitors to actually hold a baby crocodile, such as this young kid here. A part of the workshops we brainstormed, as a part of the workshops, we brainstormed their desires and values as a community, and a principal desire was to communicate to their visitors their passion for their work. Through the workshops, we worked with our uh, photographers on the issue of writing captions that spoke to the desires and values they had identified, including caring for the deer that call the island home. One of the major forms that caring takes is feeding often early in the morning, well before tourists begin to arrive. The captions for these photos will be the labels for the framed photos in the traveling exhibition we are developing. Uh, there'll be about 40, uh, give or take. At the same time, our photographers also took photos uh, of daily life in La Ventania, focused on the importance of the church and celebrations in their daily lives. The, breadth of their photographs of their community was, was actually quite breathtaking, uh, breathtaking in terms of its breadth and focus uh, as a window into their lives. Such photos uh, also focused on the importance of more mundane aspects of life uh, for these uh, quote unquote peasant farmers uh, and newly uh, engaged ecotourism hosts, such as planting uh, cornfields. And these photos and captions they have produced uh, for this project um, are what they want to tell the world about themselves and the other more than human kin, as Donna Haraway would put it, uh, that they share their lives and work with. Uh, with any luck, the exhibition will tour from late 2022 through uh, 2025. Um, and it's the hope of our community collaborators in La Ventania that um, this work will serve to support uh, a sustainable future uh, for their kids. Thanks. Thank you so much, Warner. And for someone who came from the public health sector and is very familiar with the power of participatory action research, it's wonderful to see how you've adapted that into participatory action museology. I'd like to take the opportunity now to invite both Barbara and Catherine back to join us for a Q&A session. And for those of you who are watching, please feel free to use the chat box to type in any questions that you might have for any or all of the panelists. We'll begin the, the, this Q&A session with a, a question to all three of you. As you reflect on the work that you've done, what is one significant opportunity, challenge, or trend that could impact efforts that you you've been focused on or the work that other organizations might be doing around commemoration and healing? Ed, would you repeat that? <laughs> sure. Essentially, what's one opportunity, challenge, or trend that you see on the horizon that could impact your work or the work of other organizations? Well, I can jump in. That's OK. Please feel free. At least for the kind of work that I do, uh, this focus so heavily on collaborative forms of, of working with community. Um, the most obvious uh, issue right now is the pandemic and what work in museums will look like coming out of the pandemic. Um, there's been a noted shift in the museum sector towards online and virtual kinds of work. Um, and even, so it, it's gonna be interesting to see what collaborative and participatory kinds of museum work will look like coming out of the pandemic. Thanks, Warner. And as you reflect on the work that you've done, uh, has, how has the pandemic specifically impacted the communities that, you were, that your project was focused on? They're in a rough state. There's no, uh, there's not any significant tourism in Mexico right now. Um, I correspond with them pretty regularly through social media, Facebook, um, messaging, that kind of thing. Um, they're living hand to mouth, uh, trying to gear back up as uh, the, the pandemic wanes and tourism picks back up. So it's, it's a very rough, rough moment. I haven't been in two years. 
at this point, and I'd been going about three times a year. Um, I've been trying to focus as best I could with limited access to resources on campus to actually developing, fabricating the exhibit that I was talking about. But it's been a very, it's been a very difficult moment, uh, especially for them uh, in Oaxaca. Thanks, Warren. Thanks for that question. Barbara or Catherine, what are you seeing on the horizon in terms of challenges, opportunities, threats to this type of work? Well, I see, uh, um, I, it's funny, I see a change, it's not funny, it's sad, but it's uh, promising. And that is, I think that there has been progress made since the Black Lives Matter movement started, because I think not only do Black lives matter, but so does Black history. And I think that that then is spread to AAPI and other underrepresented groups. So that we're seeing underrepresented groups coming to the fore. I speak for historic preservation. I think there's more interest in historic resources asso associated with groups. And, and I'm delighted we need to seize the moment. We need to uh, make sure more activity is happening and that it's springing from these groups and then going uh, through the channels that need to. So much of preservation work is government driven and processed. And uh, we need to make sure that, that all groups how to know how to navigate that and achieve success. So I think it's, um, it's become a moment where our broader history is being recognized by, by everybody. Thanks, Barbara. Catherine, any thoughts? Uh, sure. So with the obvious one, the pandemic that made our whole space obviously had to shut down and it became very difficult to operate as planned. So during, when COVID started, we converted uh, Eaton DC into a mutual aid resource center. Um, we started to print 3D masks for PPE with the local high schooler group. And then we also collaborated with the Red Cross to become a donation site. Um, during the March on Washington, the anniversary of the Civil Rights March, which was still during COVID, um, in, because it wasn't safe to be indoors, we activated our sidewalks and the community radio station as a place for performance and talks. And um, we, we did try doing, for all the museum people, we did try doing a, an online film festival with panels and uh, short films that we had produced as well as a lot of radio content, but it has been challenging because I, I don't know if people are burnt out from virtual content um, or if people's attention span in 2021 is just too short, but I would love to hear ideas from all of you on how we can get back to a deeper, more nuanced um, type of content creation or communication without people you know, being distracted by things like social media. I think that's been a, a challenge for us. And whether it's through social media or whether it's through the different efforts that each of you are doing, there does seem to be this common theme around visibility, around intersectionality, around solidarity. And Catherine, there's actually a question for you from Derek. Uh, given that your, your business approach is so grounded in, in these values and in, in the social justice approach, Derek's question was, has Eaton's business model been successful? And if so, what do you think is the secret sauce? Um, well, there, there has been a new movement of mission-driven businesses from the likes of Patagonia, who they're not just the clothing retailer, but they actually devote a lot of time and resources towards, you know, environmentalist causes and campaigns. Um, I think with the way people are now, especially what Barbara mentioned with the Black Lives Matter uprising and with so much more mainstream awareness of things like racism and the Me Too movement and just in the last few years, it seems to have exploded uh, a more progressive view towards um, even how mainstream corporations are taking on that messaging, although not always sincere. Um, I think that, uh, sorry, could you repeat the question again? Sure. Oh, what's, your, model, right? yeah, what's your business so, model? Has it been successful? Secret I truly sauce. Believe, sorry, I truly <laughs> believe that people are looking to support businesses that have the same values as them. And so I think we were on the verge of becoming successful, but then COVID happened and we had to close our doors. So we're still gonna be testing that out this year. So definitely the COVID pandemic has had multiple levels of impact on communities, on businesses. I know for, for many of the museum sites we'll be hearing later on, on in the second panel, uh, our, some of our sites are just now in the process of reopening. 
I want to turn to the, this piece that you had raised, Barbara, and, and so kind of this moment in time that we're in where with COVID and with the unfortunate rise in anti-Asian racism and, and, and xenophobia, there's also been the spotlight uh, on our communities. And from your work at the National Park Service, how do you think those of us who are of Asian Pacific uh, Islander American heritage might take advantage of this moment in time where there's perhaps a little bit more public interest in our community's histories. Oh, here's what I, I long to happen. I, I think the uh, people of AAPI heritage should get involved locally in local historic preservation commissions, perhaps um, try to serve on the state historic preservation review board because um, so most historic preservation um, programs, whether they be local or state, have a, um, a component of public meetings where decisions are made and um, a body of volunteers who are appointed by their uh, city council or whatever are making decisions about designations and about treatments of historic properties. And I think it would be uh, very wise for people of AAPI heritage to serve on those commissions to help shape what's getting designated and how property, historic properties are being treated. So that's the moment that I, I would seize. It's uh, that kind of volunteer work isn't for, for everyone, but I think it could be enormous, enormously helpful in inspiring um, a different avenue towards designation. And I also think it's been, that's been a, an underrepresented um, I think people haven't done that for, I mean, for example, a lot of clinicians uh, don't have uh, African Americans on them. So they, they tend to be very quiet and that needs to change. So it needs to change from the national register down to a local commission. And this is a good moment for that. Thank you for, for that, that advice and, and that perspective. Uh, I have a next question for, for Warner. And so Warner, the project that you described was working with uh, a community in Oaxaca. As you've been doing that work, what are some of the parallels that you're seeing between what the, the Mexican community down there is facing and what Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders here in the US might be facing? Are there things that are similar? Are there things that are different? Well, the community that I'm working with identify as indigenous. Um, so they're a minority, um, a large minority, but a minority nonetheless uh, in, in Mexico. And they're, um, they're also uh, all too frequently um, the target of, of violence uh, and other uh, kinds of repression. Um, so like other uh, minority populations um, throughout Mexico, actually, uh, Mexico has a Chinese community as well uh, that's minority population in Mexico. Um, so they face many of the similar sorts of issues uh, that um, the Asian American and Pacific Islander community uh, faces in just broadly speaking uh, in, in Mexico itself. Thank you. Um, they're also increasingly, uh, you know, um, immigrants uh, to the United States that face uh, um, all kinds of horrific treatment upon their arrival. Um, many are driven by environmental uh, shifts. The folks that I work with, many of them are not farming any longer because the rains don't come on time uh, or regularly. Um, and those that can't find work in ecotourism and other kinds of service industries uh, end up at our Southern border as climate refugees in a matter of speaking. Thank you. And to your point about how immigration practices and experiences are repeating itself, definitely the, the family separation of the tension that we saw at Angel Island is, is unfortunately repeating itself along the southern border today. Uh, this is perhaps a question for all three of you. And so as we think about building solidarity, as we think about uh, ingraining our organizations and institutions in the, this value of community building and, and the role that our organizations can play in bringing communities together, what does staffing look like? How might staffing need to perhaps evolve? Um, so I'll tackle that. Um, so the hospitality industry, as well as I think the business world in general, has obviously been dominated by, uh, well, if I could say white male privilege for many, many, many years. And um, at Eaton, we've really, I know that a lot of companies now, especially since Black Lives Matter and the recent anti-Asian hate crime awareness, 
Um, a lot of companies are now focusing on their DEI initiatives, diversity, equity, inclusion. And many companies are making like five-year plans and committees for how they can do outreach and reach you know, more people that they would like uh, to represent. And um, at Eaton, what's been really interesting is because of our initial intention, uh, I was just looking at our company recently and our global management is over half like people of color, uh, management and executives in leadership role, as well as uh, more women of color than white men, which is really unusual because the hospitality industry is uh, very, you know, dominated by white men for decades. So it has been a learning curve uh, for many people, but I think it's been really inspiring for, for many others. Thanks, Catherine. I have one last question for the panel before we turn to, to our second panel. This is a question from Ting Yi, and perhaps it's a foreshadowing of the session that he's helping to lead tomorrow. Given uh, all of this work that we're doing and how it perhaps has this positive impact on adult communities, uh, how can we also turn our attention to children and youth? So how might each of you see your work impacting K through 12 education? Oh, uh, wow. I, I think uh, presented correctly that children are fascinated by history. And I think historic places fascinate children. And so I, uh, you know, any way that children can be even virtually be taken to historic sites and explain what's important about those sites, I think is critical. And, uh, you know, we know during COVID the travel has been difficult, but we've also learned that people um, are not as much fun, but traveling virtually. And I, and I think um, uh, before, before this, I, I, I looked at the, the Teaching with Historic Places website and I was very impressed with the Park Services website and some of the approaches to teaching and, and we need more of that. Warner, Catherine, any additional thoughts? A couple, briefly. Um, one, you know, I ended my presentation with the slide, the two young boys from La Ventanilla. Um, the folks in La Ventanilla identified their kids and their kids' future as a major sort of impetus for the kind of work that they're doing and the kinds of ways they're changing their work and, and their lives. They're doing it for their kids. Um, so that's, that's um, sort of one uh, point to note. And the other one, and I'm glad that you, I'm glad you mentioned your familiarity with Photo Voice and, and you know, the, the work of, of, of Carolyn Wang, the uh, or Caroline Wang, the um, it's been so successfully employed as a methodology for working with youth uh, over its you know thirty year more or less history, engaging kids in doing this kind of work and documenting their lives and using that photo documentation to reflect upon and address issues they face. Is I think I think it's in, involving kids uh, in this work is a really important thing to think about as well. Thank you. And, and Catherine, you have the last opportunity to close out this panel. Great. Um, well, I was just thinking, reflecting on the value of space, especially in this post or during the pandemic, as well as uh, all the content and stories and archives and history that all of you are working on. Um, I think there's a real value. Something I've learned in the flexibility of hybrid spaces is that I think um, a lot of people have responded very positively to Eaton because we've taken spaces that are formerly commerce driven, like a restaurant or a hotel or a coffee shop and uh, turned it into that, a space with a deeper meaning and also more idealistic societal aspirations. And people are really responding to that. So maybe if society could move in that direction, having more private sector people committed to these ideals, um, we could really start to build civic engagement and discourse. Thank you for that, Catherine. And thank you, Barbara and, and uh, Warner as well for being part of our first panel. We'll invite you back for the round table towards the end of the session. But for now, we'll transition to our second panel. And in this second panel, we have speakers from three different museums across the US. Each will share some of our own perspectives and best practices about what our respective museums have been doing to commemorate, heal, and advance social justice. 
Uh, in addition to myself as panelist, I'll be joined by Cassie Chen, who is the Deputy Executive Director at the Wing Luke Museum of the Asian Pacific American Experience. She oversees planning and implementation of exhibition, collection, public programming, and education initiatives in collaboration with community members. We also will have Justin Hoover, who's the Executive Director of the Chinese Historical Society of American Museum. He has more than 15 years of exceptional experience in museum and cultural center administration, as well as international curatorial practice. And then for myself, I am the executive director of the Angel Island Immigration Station Foundation, and we're the primary nonprofit organization working with Angel Island State Park to preserve the National Historic Landmark at Angel Island, as well as its stories and histories. So first up, Cassie, I'd like to invite you to share some of what you've been working on at Wing Luke over the past year and a half. Great, thanks Ed, and hi everybody. I'm grateful to be here. Um, many thanks to the 1882 Foundation and the organizers for the symposium. Um, and greetings from the Wing Luke Museum and Seattle's Chinatown International District. So a favorite opening question for Zoom meetings this past year has been, what is a favorite place that you look forward to going back to? For me, the answer was always easy. It's Canton Alley, which is hands down my favorite cultural place. Why is it significant? It's one of two named alleys in our neighborhood. Um, Canton Alley is adjacent to the Wing Luke Museum in between the two Gung Yuk buildings. And you can see those on the left. Um, they were built in 1912. It's where the Chinese American pioneers built their family apartments to set down roots for the next generation to grow up. The alley was probably at its height in the 1930s when over 30 kids were living um, in the alley between six apartments. So over the years, the Wing Luke Museum and community partners have been working to preserve, restore and activate Canton Alley. When the Wing Luke Museum opened at its current site in 2008 in the East Gung Yik building, we preserved Canton Alley number six. And you can see it in the upper left corner. That's the red um, on the right hand side, the red windows. We preserved that family apartment, making it at the site of our neighborhood tours with groups walking outside down the alley to enter the apartment. The apartment notably became the home to Henry in the book Hotel on the Corner of Bitter Sweet. And in that photo in the upper left, we're seeing a photo of students from Cascade High School gathering outside in Canton Alley as part of their tour. Sun May is also located in the alley. In addition to being the neighborhood's oldest gift shop, it is home to the International District Emergency Center. And Canton Alley became a site of commemoration and healing following the murder of community hero Donnie Chin on July 23rd, 2015. Canton Alley is also a site in our community's fight for equity. It's an example of the long disinvestment in the neighborhood because this city right away never had a proper road constructed. And you can see um, that image in the upper right. Um, Yet recently, community members through the Chinatown Historic Alley Project, or CHAP, advocated and fundraised for repaving of the alley after a hundred years of neglect. For me, most importantly, um, Canton Alley is a place of healing and community gathering, especially through our annual alley parties every July. It's the one time in the year I know where if you're museum workers, you're always on the go. But for me, Canton Alley parties were the one day out of the year to just relax with community members. We'd have a DJ, there'd be a barbecue, artists would be playing their works, and we would have family games. So when asked what is an event that you look forward to going back to, this is definitely it for me. My heart still aches knowing that we missed it last summer and we'll miss it again this year. That said, like many others during the pandemic, we did power on and we got creative. So what did we do in Canton Alley instead? At the start of summer 2020, um, the Wing Luke Museum launched a new digital Wing Luke website. We created an interactive map, which you can see on the upper right. 
We launched virtual tours with our education guides using their phones on gimbals to lead tours remotely. And in the lower right, you can see our senior tour manager in Canton Alley with her phone um, broadcasting a tour of the alley. In mid-summer 2020, as other neighborhood businesses boarded up, we partnered with African-American artist Moses Sun to create a black and brown solidarity mural with this detail in Canton Alley, celebrating community leaders from across Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities in Seattle. And then in late summer 2020, we launched Love Letters to the CID, modeled after Wing on Woe and Company's project from New York. We issued a call for submissions of written letters, poetry, visual art, and videos. It resulted in a digital exhibit so we could connect virtually. But we also did a temporary pop-up exhibit in Canton Alley, recognizing the need to bring people back to the neighborhood, especially to support our small family businesses. And additionally, we created grocery bag inserts for neighborhood elders to provide connection another way. Last summer, as the pandemic was taking hold, um, neighborhood activists distributed about 500 grocery bags. By January, when we did another similar insert for Lunar New Year, that number was up to 2000. So what are we looking forward to? Um, this question has come up. What, what might the hybrid model um, look like? How are we emerging out of the pandemic? What are we thinking about now? We think we will continue to expand access through our live virtual tours. That's been one of the great wins of the pandemic is um, being able to expand reach. An example is our dinner date with history, which provides a live guided tour through the neighborhood, a cooking demonstration by a local neighborhood restaurant and a shopping list from a grocery store in the area to encourage individual customers to come. We're going to continue to hold to our commitment to black and brown solidarity as well, especially through um, building long term relationships. We're excited to have formed this relationship with black and brown artist collective Paradise Avenue South, who are planning an art installation inside of our museum and then potentially outside in Canton Alley as well. And we just launched our second year of love letters to the CID. We're planning similar components again this summer and submissions are open now. And you can see some of the prompts for this year, um, which speak to many of the themes that we've been discussing um, during the symposium. Asking artists and individuals, what is your response to anti-Asian hate? What does resilience mean to you and more? So that's a, a snippet of how um, we've been activating one site in our neighborhood as a museum reaching outside of our doors, thinking about commemoration, healing, and social justice. We've been doing a number of hybrid things, yet somehow I still long for the day to gather. Maybe not this summer, but I am hoping and praying for the next. Um, I do hold that in person still means, uh, still holds meaning and power and I'm aching for the return of Canton Alley Parks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cassie. And seeing your pictures, I am definitely aching to have a chance to visit Canton Alley as well. And I'm really inspired by your Love Letters campaign. Another institution that I definitely felt very inspired by is CHSA. And so we'll turn our attention now to, to Justin to share what some of uh, he and his organization have been working on over the past year. Thank you, Ed and Cassie. I'd like to give a round of applause to everybody so far. It's so difficult during the pandemic times when we're on Zoom to express appreciation because you're alone in this room. And I just wanna say how thankful I am to be in this meeting with you all, to all the audience and to you guys for your <clears throat> just amazing work you're doing. So thank you so much. Uh, my name is Justin Hoover. I'm a Chinese American. I'm the son of a Taiwanese immigrant and American father. I'm from the Bay Area, born and raised. And it's my pleasure and my honor to be working with the CHSA, the Chinese Historical Society of America today. Um, CHSA here will begin with this slideshow. One second, let me share my screen. OK, 
can I get a verbal confirmation? Do you have my screen? We're good. Thanks, Justin. We can see you. That's great. So what has CHSA done in the past? We were founded in 1963. You can see our building here on the right side. We're located at 965 Clay Street in San Francisco. Uh, here's the Transamerica building in the, you know, watching the sun rise there. And uh, we are at the corner of Joyce and Clay. This was a historical uh, building. It's got historical preservation status. And uh, this was the Young Women's Chinese, uh, uh, YWCA, Young Women's Chinese, uh, Chinese Association, YWCA, I'm sorry. And uh, it is now, uh, we took it over as the site to our museum, Young Women's Christian Association. I'm, I'm so sorry for that. Um, YWCA. And then we took it over in 1963, I'm sorry, 1996 as the museum site moving in in 2001. So uh, the background to our museum is one that, you know, we started as this historical society that was doing um, social justice work and issues around ethnic studies when in the 60s that was all brand new. So we helped forge that field of studies through publications, through engagement, through meetings, through talks, through developing um, conversations with folks by collecting items. And it wasn't until 96 when we moved into the space and renovated that we really had what was a proper museum. Now you would think that would be a, you know, a great boon to a society and it was, this museum is a wonderful asset to have, but it also, which I'll get back to later, I'll touch on this again, has its challenges once you are landed in a physical site with walls. And we're gonna talk about how we get beyond that. Um, so right now, you know, we're seeing the historical rootedness of CHSA as an archive, as a learning center, as a resource for research, as a museum exhibition producer, as a publisher, as an artist commissioner, you know, we commission new artworks, um, and as a community engagement pioneer. So creating new opportunities for Asian Americans and diverse people of color to share in conversations that are important for our society. Uh, looking forward to what we will be doing more of, these are what we see as the most important directions of it. So, you know, currently I'm, we're, we're locating our function into three main areas, CX, CHSA shows, which is in real life, IRL, uh, exhibitions, uh, traveling exhibitions, um, museum networks or pop-up shows and traveling exhibitions. We're working on CHSA, CHSA media. That's how we look at our, our education, public programs and social media platforms. And then we have projects, how we get beyond the walls of the museum through fiscal sponsorship, through technical services of local organizations and through um, creative partnerships. Uh, you know, so this is the strategic direction of CHSA to really identify itself as a series of programs that are uh, service oriented and working at changing the minds and changing the knowledge and having impact on people's lives through the lens of API people, but working with diverse people across all identities. So here's our museum exhibition right now, which is an award-winning and historical exhibition that came from the New York Historical Society called Chinese American Exclusion Inclusion. And it tells you the story of the Chinese in America, starting from trade in the 1700s between England and China, development of opium wars, manifest destiny moving west into the Americas, the, the birth of the industries that helped fuel the rise of Chinese coming to America, moving into the 18, late 1800s with the machinery of exclusion. Uh, and, and, you know, it goes and continues. We'll be seeing a little bit of this, a little bit of this show in a minute, but you know, here you can see our main exhibition. This was a theater space and a dance hall when the Young Christian Women's Association was a functioning residence and a space. But your know, exhibitions, they take many forms. Um, and this is just one of our shows. So, uh, you know, media, what does that mean for an, an institution such as ours? Well, we have a large archive of over 25,000 artifacts, and these include um, you know, there's a stewarding a material legacy of the Chinese in America. So that's objects, that's um, uh, archival uh, el objects, archival elements, and photographs and documents. So, you know, we use these as a tool to create talks, to create film screenings, to help documentaries, to create events, uh, to, and we work on public tours in, in throughout Chinatown as well. So, you know, our media is really communicating those stories in a different way than our exhibitions. 
Um, for example, one of our physical sponsorships programs, you know, is a great example of how these connect. We're working with a documentary filmmaker through a physical sponsorship pro project on the topic of Ben Fong Torres, the famous Chinese American uh, writer and art critic and music critic. And we're looking into our arc, we've we're looked into our archive for resources to provide him, uh, provide the documentary filmmaker about this topic. And the film will now be um, presented at Tribeca Film Festival very soon. And uh, you can see it there, or you can see it, hopefully we'll be able to have a private um, airing of that in San Francisco for a limited audience because uh, it's such a special event and it'll, it'll go to uh, probably Netflix after that. But, you know, so we focus on um, supporting the projects of people in our community. You know, we have a great archive of, of, of elements that document the history of the Chinese in America that show the materials. We have, a, um, uh, uh, you know, shrimping boats and, um, uh, herb grinders from the medical, uh, uh, traditional Chinese medicine shops, you know, and so that's one thing is to archive and steward the material legacy, but how do we, you know, make history today with people in our society, and that's where our projects come into play. You know, history is made, so how can we be active in the production of what is important? Uh, so we work with key cultural creatives to tell the stories that are being, that are needed today. You know, here's our impact model. So, you know, this talks about collecting, sharing, preserving important stories that elevate people of color in order to expand the narrative of who is an American. You know, we seek to dispel prejudice, combat racism, and build inclusion, right? So also, I did not specifically put in this the word the Chinese in America, although that is our main constituency and that is our primary lens that we use, but we try to make unexpected connections to diverse uh, groups, to, uh, to people who wouldn't expect to be touched by the legacy of the Chinese in America. So, you know, our, our exhibits are, you know, vi are diverse and um, really immersive. Here you can see uh, interactive elements. You can open up drawers, see TV screenings, play projections on objects, projection mapping. You know, a lot of fun. And, you know, our programs also relate to the history of the Chinese in America. We have a lot of fun virtual programs because of the pandemic. Here you can see Chinese American restaurants, the history of that, uh, made for kids, the year of the ox. And uh, really fun things like this one, Chin Ling Fu, uncovering the history of a great Chinese illusionist. So this is a diverse view of, of important Chinese stories that maybe the public aren't, isn't aware of. Uh, again, our collections is, is diverse. It includes paintings. Here you see the Jake Lee series that depict uh, an array of scenes from Chinese American life. But we also have, again, I mentioned like historical objects from um, businesses and individuals across the history of the Chinese in America. Our publications uh, speak largely to the history of, of the Chinese in America. Um, here are just some that talk about the railroad. Uh, your history and perspectives is one of our founding journals, which is distributed to universities across the nation. And again, talking about Jake Lee and the painter here um, and the history of, of, of the paintings in uh, Chinatown itself in San Francisco. Our next big exhibition to touch on quickly is about Bruce Lee. Uh, we're bringing a show in. You know, we love what we've seen at the um, Wing Luke and Bruce Lee was born in San Francisco. So it's time for us to collaborate with the Bruce Lee Foundation and bring this to San Francisco. So we're working on this, getting memorabilia from top, top collectors. And we're repositioning Bruce Lee as a unifier. Of course, he's a visionary, he's an athlete, he's a thinker, but what people don't realize was how much he had to play when, in the African-American community and the Chinese-American community and Chinese and black solidarity. So we're taking that lens to uh, bring this uh, show to a new place in the scholarship of Bruce Lee in the realm of, of social impact across um, solidarity lines. So now I'd like to talk about the how we have, um, can you all see this right now? Justin, uh, you are at time. So if you could begin to wrap up within the next minute. Thank you. I will share one screen here. Um, I will come to this screen right here and share our final project. How I mentioned was, uh, can you all see that right now? Yes. Aging and Proud. So what we see here is uh, a, a really fun program for us to get beyond the walls of the museum. Of course, we have a virtual program. Like I mentioned, we have 3D scans of our galleries, which, we're, which we won't talk about today, using Matterport and other technologies. But we're also getting beyond the walls of our galleries with a really fun inventive project by Christy Chan, a local activist and a feminist, female Chinese American artist and filmmaker, where we have very simply created a mobile projection unit that we're taking out and projecting 
across the city. So we're able to reclaim space by female-led Chinese Americans for all people of diverse colors across AAPI identities. And uh, here you can see Christy do with her project, which is called Dear America. You can follow it at, at Dear America Project. They are one of our fiscal sponsors. And this is one way that we are addressing uh, getting beyond the museum itself, beyond the walls of the museum, into the community itself to reclaim space in the digital media landscape by and for people of color who share an AAPI uh, identity and want to connect with other diverse communities. So these are the artists on the right side that we featured in our show with her this weekend. And if you follow at Dear America Project on Instagram, you can get clues to see their next gorilla projections all across the Bay Area. We hope to bring out a toolkit uh, to let anybody across the nation tap into this as a resource and build their own form of gorilla action mobile um, production unit. All right, thank you. Sorry for going over there. Thank you for your patience, Ed, and uh, for your leadership on this event. Thank you. Thanks, Justin. And it's wonderful to see the evolution of the exhibits and the projects that CHI, uh, CHSA is working on. And as you and Cassie have presented, I think there's similar themes that our viewers will, will catch on to as I start to present about some of the work that we've been doing at the Angel Island Immigration Station Foundation in partnership with Angel Island State Park over the past year and a half. So for those of you who are perhaps not familiar with Angel Island Immigration Station's history uh, from 1910 to 1940, due to the Chinese Exclusion Act and other exclusionary immigration policies of the time, the US government set up a former US immigration station to process, interrogate, and detain uh, about 500,000 people from 80 different countries around the world. The majority of them were from China, Japan, and other Asian Pacific Islander countries. And so the foundation for the past 40 years has been the primary partner to Angel Island State Park to help preserve the buildings as well as to uplift its histories and stories. And if you want to learn more about some of our work, please feel free to, to check out our website or any of our social media handles that you see on the right-hand side of the page. Our work has historically been focused on preserving the buildings so that they stand to tell the histories and emotions of, of the detainees and the immigrants who came through Angel Island. And these pictures that you see on the screen represent some of that diversity. I like to think of the foundation's work as standing at the intersections of historical preservation of museums as community building and as um, thinking about also how do we um, influence dialogue and discussion in terms of how immigrants have been treated historically in the US as well as how we might want immigrants to be treated now and in the future. COVID-19 definitely hit us hard uh, in terms of the impact that it's had on our fundraising, the impact that it's had on our programs, and not to mention the countless of, of lives lost and impacted uh, by, by community members around the world. The buildings on Angel Island have stayed closed since March of last year, and we are just now hopefully later this month uh, looking to work with Angel Island State Park to reopen that up. But what we noticed in the early initial months of COVID-19 was as we were all getting used to life in, in the pandemic, there was this sense of emotional distancing, the sense of isolation that, that many of us faced. And Cassie, similar to, to what Wing Luke did with your love letters to the community, uh, what we did at the Angel Island Immigration Station Foundation was we recognized that in order to stay connected to our supporters and our community members who no longer could visit Angel Island to feel that sense of connection to the island and its history, we had to bring the island to them. And so we established a virtual exhibit gallery that so far and over the past year uh, has featured three different exhibits. Uh, the first was Voices of Resilience, which lifted up the history of over 200 Chinese poems that were carved into the walls of the detention barracks by the Chinese detainees of the time. And it's these poems that helped to lead to the site's recognition as a, a national historic landmark. We juxtapose that though with a call out to the community to share their own poems about what they were experiencing in life under COVID detention, if you will. 
The second exhibit that we did was entitled Tastes of Home. And, and this exhibit focused on the important role that food plays in immigrant communities and immigrant journeys, how food can be a source of sustenance, a reminder of our home countries, but also for many immigrants an, an entry ramp into self-sufficiency and, and economic means. And for us, Tastes of Home was almost our version of a love letter or care package to our community. And I'll share in the next few slides some of the different components of that exhibit. And then finally, for the past seven years, we have been working to renovate and restore the former hospital building on Angel Island and had just been planning to open that building up to the public for the first time in September of last year, had to postpone that due to COVID. And so we wanted to give our community members a sneak peek into what the new museum and some of its exhibits would look like. So these are just some of the different galleries that were featured in Tastes of Home. And what you'll notice uh, amongst these different galleries is that we tried to focus not just on the experience of immigrants who came through Angel Island, but also the experiences of immigrants who came after Angel Island closed and perhaps came more recently, perhaps came from Asia and other Pacific Islander countries, but also other countries around the world. It was also important to us to, to develop that sense of connection that food could provide and, and albeit we couldn't do it in person, we created what we called our immigrant potlucks, uh, immigrant roots potluck, uh, which was a gallery exhibit that featured recipes that were collected and shared by, by members of our Angel Island Migration Station Foundation community. And as you see from the screen, these recipes really did span the gamut of, of immigrant journeys. It was also important to us to recognize that immigration is not just a, uh, a, a an occurrence that happens in the US, but immigration and migration occurs around the world. And in many ways, the, the journeys of immigrants, wherever they are emigrating from and wherever they are immigrating to, uh, shares similar themes, similar emotions. And so we had the opportunity to partner with some of our fellow museums and sites who are part of the International Coalition of Sites of Conscience, and in particular, the Migration Museums Network within that collaboration to feature some of their stories about immigration and food. And, and you'll see here that Wing Luke is, is included in that exhibit in the lower right hand corner. It was also important to us, especially given everything that was happening in our country around the ongoing racial injustices endured by African American communities and by other racial ethnic communities to link the experiences of immigrant communities with that of the continued journey towards racial equity and civil rights. And so we were very thankful to have the opportunity to profile an organization out of Atlanta, Georgia, who has been hosting dinners about racial equity where people who are strangers uh, prior to COVID, we'd come into each other's homes, watch an art piece, a, a short play, a short monologue, and then have conversations to build bridges across community. We also had the good fortune to get introduced to Dr. Ravia Zavar with Washington University in St. Louis, who'd written a book about the importance of food in the African-American civil rights movement. And through these two exhibits, we tried to draw increased understanding and empathy between what we are experiencing as Asian Pacific Islander communities and what African-American, uh, Latino, Latino, Latinx, and Native communities are also experiencing. And you'll see that represented in some of the other exhibits across the, this particular exhibition as well. I also want to commend the work that our partners at Angel Island State Parks have been doing to ensure that students in classrooms remain connected to Angel Island and still have the opportunity to learn. Prior to COVID, we had helped to offset the costs of classrooms coming to, to take field trips to Angel Island, but all of those tours have been paused since March of last year. But fortunately, for the past 17 years, California State Parks has actually had a distance learning program called PORTS, where it's an opportunity to pay pair a California State Parks ranger or interpretive staff with a classroom and to give them a virtual tour uh, of Angel Island or other sites within the California State Parks system uh, through a 30 to 60 minute online learning opportunity. And I'm not going to show this video, uh, but uh, I'll put a uh, cut and paste into the chat uh, just an example of what a ports program looks like. But what I'll end my remarks with in terms of how we're trying to think uh, 
in terms of new ways of helping to build community and new ways of helping to keep people connected to Angel Island is through this, which is our latest virtual exhibit, which is a partnership with SciArc and Angel Island State Park, where over the course of a week, SciArc came out with drones, with high-res digital cameras, with laser scanners to scan the outside of our former detention barracks, as well as two buildings within the barracks. And just very quickly, what I want to do is hopefully you can see this. Um, I'm going to stop my share real quick and launch this page. And so this is a, a virtual tour that's been created. And what's wonderful about this tour is it's got some additional information narrated by Casey Dexter Lee. And you can navigate your way literally through the park. So that is just a quick glimpse into our latest 3D virtual exhibit that we're hoping provides people with an opportunity to stay connected to Angel Island. And so with that, I'll end my remarks and I'll invite Cassie and Justin back to the screen for the Q&A for our session. And a reminder to all of you who are watching to, if you have any questions for either Cassie, Justin, or myself, please feel free to type them in the chat. Uh, Cassie and Justin, I'll start off our Q&A with the same question that I asked the first panel in terms of, it, particularly from a museum's perspective, what are you seeing on the horizon in terms of challenges, opportunities, trends that might impact the work that we're doing or, or that other similar organizations might be doing? Yeah, maybe I can just dive in. Um, um, one opportunity that I think is interesting to think about um, within the Wing Luke Museum, we've often um, had opportunities for people to honor, right? How do we bring in the sense of ritual and healing within our space? And I, I think as people come back to in-person, um, I know I am, I'm, I, I need that aspect just kind of for my spiritual and mental health. Um, and how could we look at that as an opportunity to create incredibly meaningful spaces um, for individuals and communities within our, our, our museums or without our, you know, outside of our four walls? I think that's an incredible opportunity. Um, a challenge and an opportunity that I'd love to hear more ideas on is how do we connect intergenerationally? Um, I, I'm deeply concerned about kind of the fracturing that happens between the generations, just as, you know, youth and, you know, more separation as we're seeing, you know, age differences in regards to how vaccinations are happening. How, how do we make those connections again um, and, and do that in a meaningful, powerful way? And then an additional challenge, um, which um, we've heard um, bits of, about, um, is just how do we make sure that all of these amazing spaces, cultural anchors survive? Um, I, at least in Seattle's Chinatown International District, we're really concerned about disaster gentrification. We were concerned about displacement pressures in the first place, um, but now those pressures are heating up all the more. Um, Roberta Uno, who's an amazing um, cultural leader, um, speaks very powerfully about the importance of ethnic specific cultural anchors, how they connect the past with the present to ensure our future, which is the theme, right? We're talking about how do we have a sustainable future? And I think those places are key to it. And um, they've been um, under threat this past year, we're still under threat. And um, I, I think that's something that collectively we can come together to ensure that all of these amazing special places that hold such a core part of who we are um, continue on and are able to survive and thrive. Thanks, Cassie. Justin, did you have additional things? Uh, would you repeat the question again so I remember the details? That... Sure, uh, opportunities, challenges, threats that you see on the horizon impacting museum efforts is, is the gist of the question. Thank you. Uh, well, you know, the pandemic, from our perspective, has changed so much and brought us back to some of the roots of CHSA, because as I was mentioning in my presentation, we have a museum, but that limits your vision sometimes. Like literally in the room, you can't see outside, you can't see the people in the community, but figuratively, you can't understand the bigger sense of impact of the, in the nation and, you know, beyond your immediate walls. 
So being forced into the virtual zone for all of our programming has made the museum rethink, well, what is our mission? What's our impact model, you know? So that's how we started to come to these new ideas of hybrid, like mobile museum to get outside in the world, right? Uh, virtual events, street fairs and festivals, you know? We've been working for so long about stewarding a material legacy, about bringing people into the museum, having school kids visit us. Now, how can we think about getting out to serve the school kids in their communities, in their places, you know, um, in these issues, you know? Uh, there are many ways that we see this uh, as being a challenge because of just the shift in operations, right? The shift in values. Uh, how do you uh, ramp up a marketing machine so that it now involves people and engages people um, online more effectively, you know, which we've now had a year to do and we're all doing very well. You know, we're having many more online and visitors than we are in-person visitors now, even though we are uh, technically um, able to reopen and doing that very in moderation. But uh, yeah, so our biggest challenge right now, I'm thinking, you know, is when we're looking at our impact model, how we are operationalizing, how we make real the, the actions that a museum can have. And we need to stop thinking about the museum as just a fixed wall lo geographic location, but rather as a machine for telling stories and bringing in participation in those stories. And again, it's about making history. You know, it's working with fiscal sponsors, realizing, hey, we may not have the comparative advantage to make this film. We not not be geared up to provide the infrastructure for this food festival, but you know what we can do? We can coordinate it, we can underwrite it, we can support it, we can build the structures for this and then provide the frameworks for truth and for accuracy and for a historic relevance, right? So uh, one example of this for us, you know, for example, is we have a big collection of historical signs from the buildings of pre and post-1906 fire. So around the early original Chinatown, we have the wooden signs. What does that mean for neon signs going forward? What does that mean for virtual personas going forward, like avatars of companies? So now we're working with businesses to see, you know, is there some traction for neon lights, for re-neoning Chinatown? Is there traction for, you know, the virtual? What does the storefront in the virtual space mean? So we're talking about doing street festivals, but how do we move the vendors who are mom and pop stores, Cantonese only speaking, who only take cash, who can't do DoorDash, who can't do that? How do we see their historic relevance in the larger picture of commerce and, and place making in Chinatown and place keeping in Chinatown? How do we include them into a festival in, in a way that um, stewards their existence and the presence as an important part of the fabric of Chinatown. So these are some of the questions we're looking at right now. Right. And if I can just add on, I completely agree with everything you've both said. And from the work that we're seeing at Angel Island Immigration Station Foundation, two things that, that I want to provide a little bit of a different spin on is in terms of that placemaking, in terms of that community building, for us, we have a challenge of our site is very difficult to get to. You have to, to take a, a ferry from either San Francisco or Tiburon, then it's a 1.2 mile hike with potentially 166 steps to climb. So for us, uh, and perhaps for other sites and organizations that might be difficult to get to or might not have a physical space, how do you place make? How do you build community uh, at a time where there's still some people who may not feel comfortable coming together in, in person just yet? I think the other piece is this ongoing evolution is what's the role of museums moving beyond just, uh, I think what someone had said earlier about being archival collections and thinking about how uh, museums are responsible for stepping into some of these discussions and perhaps helping to foster some of the discussions uh, that are in the communities that, that were around that are around us. Justin, to your point, when you'd mentioned the, the Cantonese shopkeepers who might not be able to, to speak uh, or might speak English uh, or speak English as a second language or might not be able to participate in a festival, we do have a question uh, from from one of our audience members who asks, do any of our sites plan to offer more bilingual or trilingual offerings in the future, especially since most Asian American Pacific Islander communities are immigrants? Uh, we know that, that two thirds of the Asian American Pacific Islander population in the US is foreign born, right? And, and one third of Asian Americans speak English with limited English proficiency. So how might uh, we ensure that our institutions offerings are inclusive of, of these communities? I'm glad this question came up. It's, it's been something we've been thinking about. Um, 
as an exciting opportunity. Um, again, one of those learnings from under the pandemic because um, we went to digital forums, right? We've been thinking about more digital tools that we can use. I'm at the Wayne Luke Museum, say with our Bruce Lee exhibit, we went old school. You can get a binder, you know, that you can get at the front desk to read translated text um, in Chinese. Um, for some of our exhibits, we've had some previous um, uh, exhibit we did with the Khmer community, the Cambodian American community, and we know that there's a fair um, some some folks who are not English literate. They're, you know that's not their primary area of comfort. So we had audio guides where you could listen and and go through. Well, how can we um, push that forward? We had some great um, experience this past year on Zoom with candidate forums and multilingual aspects, and got some good technical training on that. And then we are looking at um, um, new digital tools and want to definitely think about how to bring in language accessibility. Um, so uh, yeah. if you have any resources, please put them in the chat. That would be great. Yeah, I'm, I'm learning on this one. I can't claim any kind of exceptional knowledge or experience in this one. Um, but one way we are doing this is uh, through our, you know, our fiscal sponsorship program with um, uh, with uh, Christy Chan, she is actively taking many languages. And one of the slides that passed very quickly showed in Tagalog and in, in Mandarin, you know, Chinese, written Chinese and um, English, you know, there was another person working, uh, I forget whatever, I think maybe Vietnamese is in there, but we're working with artists in the language of their choosing. So we definitely are addressing this. Holistically, we don't have a policy on, um, on language use, although we try to produce uh, what we can in Chinese and in English. Um, the biggest challenge I see in that way and one of the areas that we hope to grow in is actually on social media. It's bringing in uh, WeChat, right? I mean, what is a Chinese American, right? I mean, the Chinese American whose family came in the 1800s, who's been here for five generations, is much different than the family who just moved here, you know, that went to a very high level university in China is now here as a technical investor in some Silicon Valley corporation. You know, is their sense of being an American different? I don't know, you'd have to ask them, but the point is there are multiple, there's such a diversity within the Chinese American identity and the API identity. How do we address that? And one of the ways is on social media and by having that kind of communication in multiple languages. So our development, associate, sorry, our marketing associate, that's one of the specific questions that we're, we're working on is like, how do we bridge that um, daily use gap, you know, on, on just general communications? Having exhibitions that are bilingual, okay, fine, that's relatively easy. That's, you know, a few days of production time to proof and to print and to check, you know, and to install a, a bilingual panel. It's much more difficult when you're doing live interpretation or, um, you know, everyday communications with different diverse communities. So that's one of the big things that we're trying to understand. So I wish I could give a better response, but the, the answer really is, as the societies keeps on emerging, as more immigrants are coming, how are we responding as, you know, we're just seeing as new things come up. Once, you know, WeChat's new, so we're just pivoting now to adapt to online forums that would require that, bring in new audiences. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to actually invite our panel one guests to also join us for the closing roundtable uh, as we are reaching the 20 minute mark before we have to end today's session. But uh, for, in response to that question for Angel Island Immigration Station Foundation, uh, we are a small organization. We only have 1.5 FTE staff and that is not an excuse for us not to offer uh, programs or, or things that have been interpreted or translated, but definitely I think we have some of the same challenges that many other small organizations and institutions have in being responsive to the 50 different languages and 100 to the 100 different languages and dialects actually that the diaspora across the Asian Pacific Islander communities and other limited English proficient uh, communities uh, would need in order to be able to learn from our histories. Uh, and so if there are any of you who are out there who are watching who who are interested in potentially partnering up with us to make sure that Angel Island's histories and stories are available to those who don't speak English as a first language, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, so welcome, Warner, Catherine, and Barbara. Uh, we do have a, a set of, uh, an initial question uh, that I wanted to pose to the group, and there have been some questions that came in for the museum panel that I would like to pose as well, but just want to note that if 
we could maybe keep our responses relatively concise. Uh, that'll help us get to as many questions as possible and not everyone has to answer all the questions. But Justin, you had raised a question on one of our, our prep panels that I thought was really interesting to surface in, in the context of our discussions. And, and it's this question about what does success look like and how do we measure it? How do we know that we're successful? And so I wanted to, to send that out to all of our panelists to see how you would respond uh, to this, I think, really important question that, that Justin raised. Well, it's easy, it's easy for, for me to speak for the National Register because we would measure it by an increased number of nominations coming our way. We know that the program has been noticed and that it's been respected and that people are interested in taking part in it. So I think that's more quantifiable than maybe a lot of what people are dealing with. Other thoughts? One thing that we look at is um, generational community leadership. So I started at the Wing Loop Museum as a volunteer and as a college volunteer. I've been able to become staff who has had volunteers, who become staff who have volunteers. So do we see that cycle of, um, um, of generational community leadership? I think that speaks to the sustainability aspect. Another aspect that in the long term that we measured our success, we do create all of our exhibits with community members to build community ownership. So when we were moving from our small 10,000 square foot space to our 60,000 square foot space, um, we were at about just under a $2 million budget and a community campaign raised over $23 million with over 1,250 individual donors. So that shows kind of that um, really strongly demonstrates community ownership financial sustainability and growth of our organization, but also our community overall. I think one very real uh, and tangible indicator is the work that our friends at Stop API Hate are doing. And over the course of the next years, it will be important to, to track to see to what degree the reported cases of attacks and incidents on Asian Pacific Islanders is either increasing or decreasing with the caveat that the reported cases may not necessarily always capture the true number of instances that are happening. We have another question that I think uh, is of interest to, to all of you. Uh, one, and it's about, as we go about our work, there can sometimes be a tendency to focus on those communities or programs that we've historically reached out to or that we already have connections with. For the different programs, for the different efforts that we're working on, how do we ensure that that is reaching other communities and how are we getting the word out uh, to folks who may not necessarily be aware of our community's histories or the work that our organizations are doing? May I respond? Go ahead, Justin. Uh, we have engagement goals at the museum. There are five. The first one is relevance. Second one is sustainability. The third one is bridging. And this is exactly what you're talking about. It's very easy to be bonding with our community, to come with our family members. Maybe it's across generations, grandpa and grandchild, and to go deeper with your family unit or to go with your wife or your dear friend and go deeper with your family unit or your friend group. But how do you meet someone and share a story in a way you don't know? And that's what bridging is all about. So our museum, for example, has made strategic partnerships that are very explicit in different community organizations that are maybe not un, even aware of the sh of, of shared um, history points that we can bring out. So this is the idea of unexpected connections through bridging. So we worked with the African American Art and Culture Complex. We're developing a relationship to launch our new Bruce Lee show, but through that lens of Black and Asian um, solidarity. So uh, our work, you know, we're trying to break out that outside of that silo, which is important for us. Thank you. Did anyone else want to respond to that question? Um, to pick up that question, I was thinking the same thing because I my background is in anthropology and in activism. And when I was in those worlds, a common challenge was how do we reach people outside of academia and activism? I assume it's similar for the museum world. How do we do outreach beyond the typical built-in audience? And um, I, I think the main thing is very similar to what Justin said, which is solidarity. 
and to what Cassie and so many of you are working on, the solidarity between different underrepresented or marginalized groups, especially in America, and also collaborations with existing organizations. I saw in just in your presentation that you had Melchin as well as Four Freedoms, and we also have done collaborations with them. So I think it's just interweaving the different audiences of all these different groups and initiatives and really trying to cross synergize in that way. Um, I, I just wanted to share a story. We we host uh, one of our Eaton House members is Machik. Uh, they're a Tibetan group uh, of academics, Tashi and Losang. They were sitting at an activist listening circle at Eaton DC and they said to me, they've lived in DC for like 20 years and never once under one roof had so many causes and communities been gathered and they were really uh, grateful for that the chance to have those encounters and collaborations. Catherine, have you start, thought about starting an Eaton San Francisco right next to CHSA? We have a, a lot that needs development. Reach out to me and we can uh, build a museum hotel there and work together. <laughs> I love well, it. I would love to. Yes, let's talk. And I'll put in a plug for Eaton Angel Island as well. <laughs> so, um, there's actually a, a, another really interesting question that, that came in from the audience that I want to make sure that we get to. And then I do want to end by giving everyone a chance to, to share what is your hope for the future as, as we then transition out of this round table. But the question is, we know that in Chinatowns around the country, they have been so hard hit, both from a health perspective, as well as from an economic survival perspective, uh, for both businesses as well as families in Chinatown? And what are some of the opportunities that institutions like ours and organizations like ours can help to save these Chinatowns uh, from the, the current challenges or how might we partner with, uh, to ensure that, that these Chinatowns remain? Um, if you don't mind me, oh, go ahead. Did I interrupt someone? Well, I'll just say very, very quickly, San Francisco is working on a larger program called CMAC, which talks about placekeeping, in which mm -hmm. the Chinatown Media Arts Collective, you know, we're working with the CCDC Chinatown Community Development Center, the biggest community development center, the Chinese Culture Center, uh, Camp Fest, you know, all these groups to form a new facility that helps us to all share resources and pool to be a different attractive agent to bring people to, uh, you know, uh, Chinatown and then from there working on our individual projects in synergy. So, you know, collaborations in that way, I think are important for um, uh, placekeeping. Um, to the Chinatown, how do we preserve and help them survive, especially during these times? I wanted to actually do an out shout out to all of you since I feel like we have a wealth of resources and knowledge on this call. Um, uh, I was talking to the Asian American Writers Workshop founder, Curtis Chin. He's been working on a video project the last few years documenting the different Chinatowns across America. And one of the documentary subjects in his film is Corky Lee, who very sadly passed away during COVID. Um, and so Curtis and I, we're actually looking for resources, grants and funding to complete this project. And I don't know what the funding landscape is like for museums and creative projects now, but um, it has been difficult for us. So if any of you have any suggestions to finish the Chinatown and Corky Lee video project, please let me know. We would really appreciate it. Thank you. So very quickly, I wanna give all of our panelists for today an opportunity to share one hope for the future. Uh, and I can start things off. For, for me, given the work that we do at the Angel Island Immigration Station Foundation, my hope is that we finally do learn from our history and that we don't replicate the, the dark injustices that started at Angel Island and are fortunately continuing on today. Mm -hmm. Well, my hope is that that uh, the kind of collaboration that Ted has fostered through his initiatives and through the summit project continue and grow. I think one of the, the most amazing things about that project is the are the number of groups that are represented and the number of people who have been on board and pushed for success for that project. And it's been very, very encouraging. Uh, I'll, I'll put forth a very lofty one. I think 
uh, and, and um, set us off on a, a high hope. Um, I, I, um, I think about the push for social justice um, that happened this um, past year and the gains that we made and being able to you know, name white supremacy and, and white oppressive systems. And my um, continued hope is that um, we would come together in solidarity with black indigenous and other people of colors that we wouldn't let the system pit us against one another, but that we would really collectively be able to um, focus on dismantling that system as, as a whole. So that's my big hope. I'll, I'll pick up on uh, uh, Cassie's lofty uh, uh, take on this. Um, I think for the museum sector more broadly, um, being places that foster com compassion and empathy um, is maybe an overarching, for me anyway, an overarching way to think about some of the things that Cassie's just emphasized. Um, I, I don't think there's any more important work to be done uh, at, at this particular moment, personally. I guess that leaves me now. Oh, Catherine, did you want to go? Oh, sure. Thank you, Justin. Um, I think with the rising cost of living and rent in so many urban metropolises, as well as the rise of tech, my hope is that we can continue to think outside the box to support and innovate the creation of exhibition spaces, space for history, and for thinking about the future, as well as building true community centers. In the spirit of Canton Alley, I was really inspired by that example. I would like to reiterate the solidarity ideas and this idea of active community and my specific dream or wish is that history is an active verb and uh, people see it as something we participate in as opposed to something that some expert points to on the timeline. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Ed, your sound is so sorry. Okay. Thank you for that. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Justin. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Cassie. Thank you, Catherine. And thank you, Warner, for sharing not only your hopes, but also your best practices and promising practices for how each of our institutions and those watching can potentially continue this very important work of community building, healing, and solidarity. And with that, I will turn it over to Ted to close out today's symposium. So, you know, I want to make sure that we uh, thank this panel, really six brilliant, talented people, Ed, Barbara, Catherine, Warren, Casey, and Justin. Thank you so much. You know, it's uh, having hear, heard this session, I'm so actually assured that there is so much talent out there and so much experience that it helps reinforce the idea that we need to make sure that we maintain uh, these pockets of uh, experimentation and 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 building of our stories. Now, uh, I also want to make sure that we give a shout out to uh, Wei and also to Bianca and to Mei and to Hong Yin who have worked in the back rooms to make sure that all the logistics have uh, come into play. So thank you all for the for uh, your participation. And I also want to thank all of you for coming here to join us for this uh, second day of the symposium. Now, I originally wanted to talk a little bit about the nomination for the uh, National Trust for Historic Preservation nomination for the summit site. This is actually for us a very monumental, uh, very significant nomination. I hope all of you can write to various peoples and support it. But in, I want to point out that these type of milestones and these things are not done in the void. Uh, we've been void. We've been working on heritage tours and public-private partnerships since Symposium 1. And each year with our program director like John Cassano, we have incrementally strengthened relationships with the Department of Interior, even as early as say, uh, our, Frank, our education advisor, Franklin Oda was involved in the original theme studies before there was even a foundation. But the inspiration, and we got inspiration from the History and Places Project by Department of Interior Education, as that, such as Kathy Orr. Bureau of Land Management, especially with the U.S. Forest Service in California. 
uh, we were inspired by the model that the U.S. Forest Service pioneered with Wing Look Museum for heritage tours to Chinese mining, logging, and settlement sites throughout the Pacific Northwest. And that led to the 1882 Foundation to work with historical societies in Southern California, Chinese American Citizens Alliance, and the CHSA in San Francisco, all participants in our symposium from the very start which then produced the, uh, from these uh, interactions, the Explore APA Heritage website, a self-guided tour by uh, Forest Service and hosted by the CHSA. Again, a member of the symposium, in the case of CHSA, a founding contributor to the 1882 congressional effort. Our goal again for the foundation is to build collaborations and best practices, which I've said repeatedly that heritage tours were turnkey. They can link or lead to other programs and projects affecting our mission objectives. So the next uh, iteration of the collaboration after the APA Heritage, uh, Heritage website uh, was the collaboration of running tours among symposium, class, uh, uh, symposium participants came with the 1882 foundations. Thank you, John Casano, Dota Kwong and Fred Wong from the Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management for developing our overnight tour to the summit tunnel and reaching out to create educational, educational spinoffs from the tours. This included working with UC Davis on teachers training and lesson plans and supporting the Forest Service production of a short documentary legacy that we promote in public program today. I just gave a tour, a talk with that, uh, talk about that with the Department of Labor recently. The formula of an overnight tour versus the week tour, the wing look example was a breakthrough for us and we are confident more tours and projects are in the offing. In fact, we are in the process of advising the Bureau of Land Management on another short educational film. All of this was advanced through a clear vision several years ago before 2019 to focus on national attention on Chinese American history by celebrating the 150th anniversary of the Transcontinental Railroad. And for us, the focus on the sum, and we decided to focus on the summit tunnel rather than at promontory where most celebrants were heading. That led to Symposium 7 being held at the National Museum of American History, special exhibits on the, the Transcontinental Railroad, coordinated with activities at the U.S. Postal Museum, including the printing and release of a Transcontinental Railroad stamp. And there was an event at the Library of Congress attended by the congressional members. So, when one day I received a phone call from Barbara Wyatt asking about identifying API sites for the possible no nominations to national landmark or memorial status, I was able to immediately point to the summit tunnel and had all the information visuals to make the case. I have to give a shout out to Barbara Wyatt. You know, one person can really make a difference and her persistence and patience and knowledge of the processes allowed us to move forward with the Department of Interior funding for an archeological survey of China camp, which is underway now, and which is critical for the next step of making the landmark nomination. Still a couple of years away and uncertain, but it is moving steadily forward. In the meantime, our understanding of the summit tunnel and its tremendous educational value for Chinese American and American history has grown. And we've also seen challenges because of the minimally controlled visitations increased as increasing rapidly and the shameful graffiti and disrespect for the area. I think all of us know or believe that it would be helpful to have a site recognized as a national law, landmark, but a plaque and a signpost does little to actually protect the site. And the designation can be an unfunded mandate. It can't be an unfunded mandate on any government partners or be one that ignores the needs and concerns of the property owners. The site overlaps various owners' property. Thus, the 1882 Foundation's effort include refining our heritage towards the summit to make them truly self-funded and steadily building trust and arrangements for an interpretive program on site supported by consensus-driven public-private collaboration. This will take some work. But the National Trust Historic Preservation uh, nomination helps us tremendously. It affirms through its selection the national significance of the site, and we can draw upon that endorsement to strengthen our arguments for establishing, establishing the interpretive program. 
Now, we don't have too much time left today. I'm sorry to have said so much about the announcement, but I did, I want you to understand that these steps, these nominations, these milestones do not happen on their own. The seeds of today's nomination, the National Trust nomination, which is a major step for, forward into an eventual National Historic Landmark designation by Congress or the President several years from today, and the principles of an interpretive program we hope can be hammered out by this summer are accomplished, are accomplished by individuals linking with other individuals over time through associations and collaborations such as the 1882 symposium or the quote unquote network, which I had mentioned at the opening session yesterday, yesterday. As I mentioned yesterday also, a characteristic of the symposium is that the symposium concludes with a milestone to complete, to be completed during the year before the next symposium. And I had teed up the milestone for this year to be a commitment from participants to join the network and the symposium together, perhaps funded by the TAP, perhaps to evaluate a community-centric museum and not be so concerned about where it is to be placed, but trying to see all that is possible and imaginable from today's session and with all the talent that we had here to answer a question posed yesterday, which I very much appreciated Jack Chan's and follow-up remarks why spend money to establish and maintain an APA museum on the National Mall? Why not imagine a national APA museum, quote unquote, to be a nationally funded network of digitally connected exhibits and programs of artifacts and stories held in regional and local connections and even within hotels that includes physical hybrid exhibits continuously circulating among the network. Today's day three session, our final day, yay, it's all about education, that's tomorrow. So uh, we expanded the original program because community and national attention to the Black Lives Matter movement and the anti-Asian, anti-Jewish violence has exploded the number of efforts, debates, and approaches to teaching and learning about APA topics. The issues deserve more attention than we had originally planned and hope to see you all tomorrow for that. So. So those remarks are passed back to, to Wei and uh, we're heading slightly past the hour. Great, thank you. Um, thank you so much to everyone for spending the time with us this evening or afternoon, wherever you may be. Um, and as Ted said, please do join us again tomorrow um, for our third day of discussions. So the event tomorrow will, on Saturday will take place at 1 p.m. Eastern time or 10 a.m. Pacific. Um, and the session is titled Building Consciousness Through Asian American Studies Education. Um, and we'll address questions relating to the state of Asian American studies education in K-12 grades and beyond. And our speakers will showcase the curriculum unit developed by 1882 Foundation and the DDP project, highlight collaborative efforts to develop education programs and digital toolkits, uh, and discuss grassroots movements to bring AAPI experiences into the narrative of American history. So thank you all again to um, our speakers and audience members for um, this wonderful um, session today, and we really hope to see you tomorrow. <laughs>